Hello, my name is Don Hanshu. I'm one of the pastors here at Delby and I met this church, and I'm so glad that you're allowing us to join with you and worship at your home, uh, with your family, or with your friends, wherever it is that we're able to connect with you. We're glad to have you for worship today, and I want to invite you to jump into worship with me in an attitude of prayer. God, as the snow is uh, coming to our area, we just pray that as that blanket of snow covers the ground, that we would see it as a reminder of how your grace covers every imperfection in our life and how you wish for us to have a new start every day. God, guide us now in worship to put our focus on you, and we give you praise. Amen. When I was a young child, I, was, <laughs> I always loved playing in the woods, and a lot of my friends would get together and we'd, we'd go play in the woods, and you're just older elementary age or so, and each day, it seemed like, or each summer, we got a little bit further back into the woods. To ultimately, one summer, we found an abandoned house out in the woods. Have you ever found an abandoned house? I mean, what do you do? You come across an abandoned house, you go in, right? So, well, it took us actually multiple days to have enough courage because the place looked freaky. It had all these vines growing up the outside. A tree was leaning against it. Most of the windows had broken out, and it was deep in the woods. There was no sign anybody had been in that house for years or decades even. So finally, we got the courage to go to a side door that was already kind of cockeyed open. It had kind of weathered itself and rotted and, and was already mostly open. And it was a bright, sunny summer afternoon. As we stepped into that home, it was dark. It was cold. It smelled weird. And it was just kind of a, a ghostly kind of weird feeling. There were these strange stains on the wall and on the ceiling and, and pieces of broken glass from the windows and broken bottles and fragments of furniture that had been broken up and not a lot in the house. There were some pictures that had these, that told these really ghostly weird stories of how, you know, they'd fallen off the wall and the picture was faded and water. It was just, it was just strange, but we were on an adventure. And as we went into the house, we'd venture into each room and we'd, of course, we'd, you know, open up, if there was anything to open up and look up underneath stuff and found these newspapers from like 40 years earlier, just after the World War II or so. And it was just fascinating to look at all that stuff. And we got to the final, the last room. We thought we were done. We were feeling really strong. And, and then we saw there was a set of stairs, very narrow, over in the corner. What are we going to do? Of course, you're going to go up the stairs. And one by one, we go up the stairs. And we look around, and there's absolutely nothing upstairs. We look around a little bit more, and we start ready to, to head back downstairs. And we could hear this light rustling. We thought there was nothing upstairs. But on a closer examination, we found that over a kind of an adormered kind of closet, a little small two-foot by two-foot closet, there was something that was rustling behind that closet door. Now, I'm not really sure how it happened, but somehow I was commissioned to be the one who would open the door. And with a friend over each shoulder, I reached out with trembling hands and grabbed a hold of that little bitty doorknob and just as I began to pull and fling it open, it almost burst open on its own. And about a half a dozen starlings flew into that small room and around and beat on the walls and finally went out the windows that were broken. And we scampered, screamed, and flopped all over the self and probably almost soiled ourselves before we realized that it was just a bunch of birds. And then we laughed until our sides hurt. It was definitely one of those memorable afternoons. But... Have you ever seen that kind of house, abandoned, dust-covered, uh, this kind of freaky kind of look? You're not sure if you should go in or, or do you want to? Well, in the same way, I wonder if you see a connection between the abandoned parts of your heart. Places where there is shame and pain and names that you don't want anybody to know about, that you've really left in the woods to be overgrown and forgotten. Because if someone was to find out about some of that shame, pain, and names in your heart, they might think of you differently. They might not uh, respect you the way that you want to be respected. And the person you want people to see you as may not actually be the person you are. So you have this abandoned home in your heart. If you feel like that you've got those kind of places in your heart, I'm really glad you're worshiping with us today. Because I want to help you. As a pastor, we're going through this worship series uh, talking about how we want to help you put your life back together in a way that's piece by piece. 
And what we're doing is modeling this worship series after the 12 steps of recovery uh, through Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Gamblers Anonymous, whatever, you know, a recovery process you might be familiar with. And, and if you're saying, well, I don't need recovery, great, good for you. But you probably know somebody who does. And when we're really honest, we all have hurts, habits, and hang-ups that we need some help with. And it may not be alcohol, drugs, or gambling. It may be anger or resentment or grief. So today as we worship together, I just want to give you a quick reminder of how we've been moving in this worship series. We started off about looking how you can have peace with God. And in this section of, of sermons that we've done the last few weeks, we're talking about having peace within ourselves. And then we're going to move into a section about having, finding peace with others and ultimately come to a section or a closing sermon about how we keep that peace. Even when things continue to get tough again, how do we keep that kind of peace? Now, if you remember, uh, Don Sheila was here last week and he did a, a, a very fearless moral inventory and told us and shared with us how he was struggling with this battle with Mountain Dew and Ding Dongs. Now, I gotta tell you, some of you all, some of you all texted him pictures of Ding Dongs and Mountain Dew this week. What are you doing? We gotta help the man. Don't create stumbling blocks for him. Come on. It, it was a little funny though, honestly. But if you really wanna have a transformation of your heart, if you really wanna have some peace in your heart, you have to have some type of moral inventory to realize you've got to trust God is going to work with you and realize that it's not your will that can do this. It's God that can do this through you. And then you've got to recognize the things in your life that you really need help with. And then to have that kind of transformation, we've got to give these things to God. And that's really where we're talking and, and starting today. And, and to skip to the end of where this message is, my hope and prayer for you is that you will have transformation, personal transformation, transformation that helps you get over the hurts, habits, and hang-ups that hold you back in so many different ways. And if there was a message that I've preached in, in a, a last number of weeks that, that I really would want you to take notes on, this is it. This is one of those messages, it's a lot of material, but I want you to get it because it connects the dots about how you can really clean out, throw the windows open in that abandoned home of your heart so that you can find a deeper peace with yourself. And where do we get this from? Well, Romans uh, chapter 12, verse 2, it's fascinating that 2,000 years ago, there was a man named Paul who wrote this letter to people in Rome who were going through a very difficult time. And he's talking about some of the same issues that we're talking about today. And I think it's just amazing how Scripture is ancient and yet timely again and again and again. And he's writing to these people in Rome who have seen terrible difficulties as being a follower of Jesus. And he says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Now what's he mean? He's not saying, you know, don't conform to the laws and the rules of the world. He's saying, you know, it, it's important to follow, you know, uh, you know, for us to follow the traffic laws. It's important to follow, you know, uh, you know, the, some, some, you know, things that we do in community that help us all be safe. It's important to follow those kind of, those kind of patterns. But there's other patterns of how we handle our pains, our hardships, our, our hang-ups, our addictions, our struggles, that, that we do not want to conform to the patterns of this world. And he goes on to say, we do this by transforming or renewing of our mind. And it's interesting because he could have said you could do this by removing yourself and running from Rome, running from your problems and going somewhere else. But instead he says, no. He's saying you've got these, these challenges, these problems that are around you, and the way that you win is you have the transformation of your mind. Don't conform to the way the world wants to. wants to run from these things, ignore these things, abandon them. Paul is saying, transform them by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to, what, what, is, what does he say? You're going to be able, this is the so that statement. If you transform your mind, you'll be able to uh, test and approve what God's will is. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus and you're leaning into this right now, you're like, well, yeah, that whole God's will thing that doesn't really do it for me. Or, or maybe you are a follower of Jesus and you're like, you know, I, you know, I struggle with following God's will. Well, this is what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. See, God has a hope and a purpose for you and it is good, pleasing, and it is perfect. 
And when we have a transformation of our mind, begin to test and approve that, what God is asking in our lives, we'll find that it's good, pleasing, and perfect. And that's what I want for you, is to have to clean out that, that kind of haunted, kind of lonely, that abandoned place in your heart and fill it with a good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Now, as we think about the movements that we have in this, I want you to understand we need to understand who we are. So how do you become you? How is it, how is it that you became the you that you are? Uh, where did all that, that, that people would describe you as? Where did that come from? Because I really strongly feel that if you don't understand who you are, then it's really hard for God to work with you to help you become who God wants to help you nurture toward. So how did you become the you that you are? Uh, there's really three influences, and I've heard this creatively said in different ways. It's your chromosomes, it's your circumstances, and it's your choices. And think about it like this. You think about your chromosomes, and you got 23 chromosomes from your mom, 23 from your dad. They come together, and they make the unique you that you are. And, you know, that determines your hair color, your eye color, and the size of your foot. But it also determines other things about you, too. When those chromosomes come together, it might mean that you're more pre determined to have thyroid issues or that you might be predetermined to have eczema or it might be more predetermined that you're the way your mind thinks you might be more of a of a problem solver see some things you just inherit and that's the chromosome that kind of dna part of you but there's also circumstances that help you become you and this is really important uh, as you think about your circumstances. I've been doing a lot of uh, study and work personally in the Enneagram and in attachment theory over the last couple months to try to understand myself better and also understand how I interact with others and also be a better pastor to people as I try to look at different ways that we interact and what that looks like when that lays over on top of each other. And, and when you think about your circumstances, really when you understand who you were and how things influenced you as a child, it, it begins to make sense. See, how you're raised has a, a big impact on who you are. Think of it like this. For example, Let's say that as a child, you found out early on that if you made really good grades, perfect scores on most of all your tests, your parents would give all kinds of praise to you. And you didn't want to disappoint your parents, so you worked really hard to always make perfect scores because that got you praise. Now that works for you as a child. But now as an adult, when you go into the workplace and now you're responsible for other people and you've you got to pay your taxes and you, you know, relationships are much more layered than you were when you were a child, if you still strive for that same kind of perfection in your adult life in all areas, when there's really not a test that you can check off on, it's exhausting. And it really can weary you in ways that puts you on a wrong path. So that's one way you can see how you're being raised has an impact on you. But think about another one. Think about maybe if you had parents when you were a child that were just emotionally unavailable for you. Maybe you had to endure a divorce of your parents, or maybe one of your parents had something great happen in their life, and they were promoted to this, this wonderful position, but there for two or three years, they had to work an insane amount of hours when you were really developing emotionally as a child. And in that relationship, you, you wanted to be around your parents. You loved your parent, your parents, or however that was for you. But they may have been physically there, but emotionally just not present. So you taught yourself how to survive with that. You put a ceiling or, or a barrier. It's like, you know, you only had so much emotional intimacy because you didn't want to be hurt. You didn't want to be abandoned by that. <clears throat> that worked for you as a child. But now as an adult, when you have an adult relationships and you create this barrier that other people can't get through because you learned that was a good thing for you, a safe thing for you to do as a child, as an adult, that means you're going to limit yourself from the full potential of what it means to have an emotionally intimate relationship with someone else who wants to be with you and trusts you and loves you. So what we find out is the circumstances that we're often raised in can really have an impact on us. A lot of our defects are simply self-defeating attempts to meet unmet needs that we had as a child or that we feel like we deserve. So there's are two things, two ways that you become you. But what's the third way? And that's the choices. So as a pastor, I want to do one of the most exciting things I can for you right now, and I want to show you some math. I mean, I know you're on the edge of your seat. You're like sermon plus math equals unbelievably good time. So here it is, math. 
Choices over time will equal habits. It's not exactly like the math you're thinking about, but choices, the more, the, the more these choices that you do over time will ultimately make habits. You know, this is a good thing, right? Brushing your teeth in the morning and the evening. That's a good choice that you make over time becomes a habit that you do daily so that your teeth don't fall out. That's a great habit to have. Also, when you think about habits over time, they start to become your identity, plus they have a payoff. Let me give a different example. I like to run and to work out and to be physically active. So that's a habit of mine. Um, some people would say that's part of my identity. I identify with other folks who like to work out or people understand that's something that I do and they'll ask me things about, uh, about being healthy in those kind of ways. And, um, you know, I, that, that's part of my identity. But the payoff for me to, to do those kind of activities is that it makes, well, I generally feel really good and I'm able to, to play hard with my kids. I'm able to do physical things around my home. I really enjoy that. So that's the payoff for me. But there's also a bad side to this. For example, let's say some of the choices you've made over time has turned into some, some habits and those habits over time have become part of your identity, such as how you use anger to try to control or manipulate other people. Because the payoff is you get what you want. And you say it's part of your identity. Someone says, do you realize that you often come across as angry? And then you say, well, that's just who I am. That's a good sign that perhaps your habit is not healthy for you or those that you love. So we have these uh, chromosomes, these circumstances, these choices that we make that begin to influence us. And remember what it says in Romans Chapter 2, verse 2, it says, Do not conform to the patterns of this world. Be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So if we're going to renew our mind, what is that process? I hope I have your attention. It's like for you to become you, there are certain influences, but for you to become who God wants you to, you need to know how you got to be you, and then you need to make some choices about how you're going to be transformed, allow your heart to be transformed, to clean out that abandoned places in your heart. So think of it like this. If you're going to cooperate with God by doing this, because God, you know, God's not going to force your way into this. God's going to give you free choice. God is going to co want you to cooperate with God's hope and will in your life. And to do that, we need to focus on changing one thing at a time. Having one victory at a time. And then ultimately, we'll be able to see focusing on God's will and not mine is how we'll get there. Let's take these step by step. Changing one thing at a time. Uh, <laughs> there was a friend of mine who had a beagle, and he wanted to teach it how to chase rabbits for hunting. And he came over to my house when I was a kid, and we had this, uh, this, this field behind our home, always tons of rabbits in it. And we went over to this big briar patch. He has his beagle on the collar, lets it off, and it jumps into the briar patch. And all of a sudden, there's like four rabbits that go flying everywhere. The beagle jumps out, and then kind of goes this way, then that way, this way, and he can't figure out what to do. And by the time it does try to figure out what to do, do, the rabbits are in other bushes now. So the same way with us, as it says in Proverbs, a wise person keeps wisdom in view, but a fool's eyes wander to the ends of the earth. We need to focus in on one thing and not be scattering all over here. So, you know, when you think about your own life, it's like, you know, I do have some things I need to work on. There are some habits, some hangups that I really need to work through. Oh my gosh, which one am I going to work on? Choose one. Don't let yourself get overwhelmed by trying to do a bunch at the same time. Just choose one. So you want to change one thing at a time and have one victory at a time. What does that mean to have one victory at a time? Let's say, you know, you are a, a person that's going to go to work on Monday if it's not snowed out, and you, you have a boss that is just absolutely irritating to you, and it's, you get so resentful and frustrated because the boss never appreciates you, always asks you to do more, these kind of strange topics and, 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 and activities that, you know, kind of distract you from your core purpose. It gets so frustrating. Have one victory. Say you got to show up at work at 9 o'clock. Tell yourself, from 9 to 11, just two hours. I'm going to be kind, I'm going to smile at my boss, and I'm not going to say negative things, just for two hours. That's a victory. The rest of the day, you know, you just, if, 
you just kind of allow natural things to happen, but you know, for two hours you had a victory. Or maybe you're, you're a student at school, and you know, you've got, you're in person, uh, and it's, you know, it's frustrating to you with this teacher who always seems to be driving so hard on you. Your class is what, 60 minutes, maybe 90 minutes total? Half of that class, try for half of the class to be kind and respectful to your teacher. And after that half part of the class, the teacher's still on you, and natural things just kind of occur. Or maybe you're a teacher, and you've got that student the same way. You see how this works. You don't have to, you know, do it all day, do it all week. Just have a one small victory at a time. And it says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 11, it says, Give us today our monthly bread. No, it's our daily bread. Give us this day our daily daily bread. So having one small victory, that is the way to make good progress in this. And then ultimately, we've got to change one thing at a time, have one victory at a time, and it's got to be God's power, not mine, if we're going to really have transformation. And what does that begin to look like? Well, if you could do these things, if you could change these habits in your life with your willpower, you would have already done it, but you can't. So we need to remember that in Philippians chapter 4, I can do all things, and a lot of us would really like for that passage to stop right there because it feels like a superhero. And you say, I can do all things. But it continues. And it says, through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all, I can do really nothing without Christ. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So to have this transformation, to, to clean out this, this abandoned place in your heart, this abandoned home in your heart, I'm not asking you to try to tackle all the things at one time. <laughs> but if you really want to put your heart back together, your life back together, piece by piece, change one thing at a time, have one victory at a time, and focus on God's power, not mine. See, I'm not asking forever, just asking for a week. And it's going to snow, so it's probably going to be real easy for, you know, a couple days for you. Don't have to, don't have as much access to people. But what if you did this just for one week? focused on one thing, small victories, and focused on God's power, not yours. What would I mean did it for one week? Remember, you got to celebrate your progress. It's not perfection. You celebrate your progress, not perfection. See, God wants you, we as pastors want you, to put your life back together piece by piece. And if you want to talk with one of us about what that looks like, call us on this number, text us on this number. We want to help you on this journey. I invite you to pray with me. God, we need you. We struggle, Lord, with these habits and so many things, these pains, shames, and names of, of people in places where we just wish would go away. But Lord, we haven't dealt with them. They keep coming back up in our lives. Give us courage, Lord, to really focus just on one thing. Celebrate the small victories so that we can learn to trust you more than ourselves as we try to put our lives back together piece by piece. We give you praise, Lord, for hearing our prayers. Amen. Speaking of prayers, there's nothing more important that you could do that I would love for you to do this morning, and that's to be in prayer for people in our church and in our community. I want to extend our sympathy to the family and friends of Flo Hetherington and the death of her sister, Fanny Songer. Firm services were yesterday, um, January 30th, in Pembroke. So I want to extend our sympathy and care to Flo. Also want to... Uh, lift up some current concerns. Um, I invite you to be in prayer for Don Adams. I spoke with Jody yesterday, and um, things are serious. I just invite you to be in prayer for Don and his health. He had a strong day yesterday, but things are very serious. Continue to pray for Eric Woodrum um, as he struggles with kidney cancer, and uh, Joyce Taylor, who's a, a friend of some folks in our church. Many of you know Nora Bowling, Emily and Chris's uh, young daughter. Uh, she is, um, has been diagnosed with COVID and kind of waiting for other testing to come out. So I invite you to pray uh, for the family. Pray for Howard Weaver and for Kim Dunbar as well. Mary Dice, so wanna, she continues through her grief of losing a couple relatives this, uh, a week ago. And Eva Owen, who's having some chronic pain um, and it's just, just very frustrating, very difficult for her. Continue to be in prayer for Eva. For Jim and Annie Laurie James, who also have some health issues right now, Louise Davis, um, who's struggling with some eyesight problems right now, and then Bonnie Congdon, who has some outpatient surgery this week, and also pray for the Bailey family, as Christine Bailey's mother is now living with them again, but is in very serious health um, decline, and I invite you to be in prayer for them 
uh, during this transition that they have <clears throat> as a family. Also, uh, you know, again, if you want to talk to us as pastors, uh, want to connect with us, uh, there's also other folks in our church who are great resources for, uh, for care and walking with you. And uh, feel free to text or call us on this line. But if you have any questions, if you're concerned, you know, about your COVID exposure, call this number. And uh, COVID exposures in our community have kind of plateaued slowly, maybe going down, and that's a really good thing for us. Uh, so we can ce- celebrate that, continue to wear your masks and social distancing, uh, because we can, we can really beat this if we continue to do our work. And thanks to all those who are helping do vaccines and are still on the front lines, making all this still come together. Thank you for your work with that. Um, also, we're going to do this church survey. You can text YASC to 90888 text YASC to 90888. And um, what that do, what you'll do with that survey, it takes maybe five, seven minutes to do. I just want to get some feedback from you about what you need to see happening here in church to make you feel safe and comfortable here. And also just kind of check in with how you're doing emotionally. It's, just, it's very difficult to try to connect with everybody individually. So if you do this, this allows us to hear from you and then follow up with you a little differently. And uh, this was the same survey we used back uh, March, April. And uh, just to kind of check on you as well, we want to compare to see how things are going overall as a church. If things improved, uh, got worse, where we are on that. So there's a couple of things. Also, we've got a couple of celebrations. This is our bag to bench. Remember all those plastic bags y'all been collecting? Um, we're not going to start that up for another couple months again, but continue to collect those bags at your home. Well, we collected enough, like 500 pounds of, of plastic bags, which is a ton. I mean, that's just a lot of bags. Um, last summer, we, got, we ended up with a, with a bench. It came to us just after Christmas, uh, unassembled. And Megan and Andy Smith, mostly Megan, uh, put that thing together. And here's a quick picture of it. They did a great job. Can't wait till it warms up when we get that up there at the Dudley Shelter. So thanks, everybody, for recycling your bags, keeping them out of the landfill. Good job with that. So um, also there's a Nicaragua uh, mission trip. We're looking at doing that in June 18th to 25th. I know some of you are like, really? We're going to try to travel? You know, if you don't make plans now, if things were to open up so that we could, uh, then we wouldn't be able to. And if we get closer to that date and we see that it's just not safe for us to be on the ground because of elections or COVID, you know, we're obviously going to stop. But either way, that allows us to be planning in that way. And you just contact Doug or Melissa Swanson, or myself or Don, and we can make sure you have the link to get on uh, with a Zoom call tonight, January 31st at 7 p.m. It's a Zoom-only meeting. So <clears throat> also with Lent coming up uh, here in February 17th, I believe, um, we're going to have some Lent kits, a lot like we had for Advent, with some special supplies. We're going to have like a two-foot cross with some cloth that you can put in your front yard, um, um, some other things that you can interact with, some little tattoos you can put on yourself for Ash Wednesday. We'll have an Ash Wednesday service that we will um, that we'll have for you to be able to view, and you can participate online with those things. So you can pick up your Lent kits starting Monday, February 8th. Um, and if you need one delivered to you, just contact us in the church. We'll make sure that we get one uh, to you. We're prepared for 70. Uh, last time, it's about how many Advent kits we, we got. If we need more, we'll make more. But um, just be in touch with us as a church. We'll be glad to get those to you. So I invite you to pray with me one more time uh, as we celebrate and as we lift up concerns for all those individuals. God, you hear our prayers, and you know what's going on in our lives and our homes right now. You know the things that are going on in our hearts that we've not told anybody about. And yet, Lord, you love us anyways. We pray for these brothers and sisters in our congregation who have some very serious health issues, others who have transitions that they're facing, others that we're not even naming but have lifted up concerns about their employment, uh, concerns about what's going on with family members in other parts of the country. God, we just pray for peace in our hearts so that we can seek and see your wisdom and apply your wisdom in our life as we face so many different challenges. God, thank you for the the strength and the beauty of this congregation as a heart that beats for you, for us to be a witness to the people who don't know you. Continue, Lord, to bless us, not to be a blessing that we hold on to, but a blessing that we give out freely to others. God, we give you praise and thank you for hearing our prayers now. Amen. If you're someone and you enjoy being part of this church and connecting to our church and the ministry we have here, I invite you to give online through dublinumc.com backslash 
give. Um, if you are uh, attending our church online and you were one of many churches that you, you watch online, that's awesome. We're glad that you're doing that. Make sure that you support your home church, the church that you're deeply connected with, um, and because all churches need your support. But make sure you connect with those churches that you have the history with there. They could use that. Also, uh, I want you to do something. Um, this is the fifth Sunday in the Holston Home for Children. Uh, you've heard John Freeman talk about this. Um, you can go to the same giving site and you can make a gift above and beyond your normal giving to help the children who are often without homes or need foster care. That's all through Holston Home for Children. You can do that this Sunday, especially as the fifth Sunday. We encourage you to do that. And then something that we've been doing that has just been really great is that if before you hit the stop button or the pause button on your remote control or get up and, and turn off the TV, I encourage you to text a friend right now and to let them know that you're praying for them. And if you don't have a phone, you don't text, just put your hands together right now. Ignore everything else I'm saying and just offer up a prayer for your friend. That kind of impact can never be calculated and how it helps all of us in that way. So text a friend, pray for a friend. And I'm just so glad that you've been part of <clears throat> worship with us today. And, and look forward to having you here with us next week as we continue in this series, talking about how we can get our lives back together piece by piece as we trust in God, moving in our lives in that way. So glad to have you with us. Go in peace. Amen.